everyone, my name is Tonya Michael and today I will be reading an extract from the book Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. Swamp water is still and dark, having swallowed the light in its muddy throat. Even night crawlers are diurnal in this lair. There are sounds, of course, but compared to the marsh, the swamp is quiet because decomposition is cellular work. Life decays and reeks and returns to the rotted duff, a poignant wallow of death begetting life. On the morning of October 30th, 1969, the body of Chase Andrews lay in the swamp, which would have absorbed it silently, routinely, hiding it for good. A swamp knows all about death and doesn't necessarily define it as a tragedy, certainly not a sin. But this morning, two boys from the village rode their bikes out to the old fire tower and from the third switchback spotted his denim jacket. The morning burned so August hot the marsh's moist breath hung the oaks and pines with fog. The palmetto patches stood unusually quiet, except for the low, slow flap of the heron's wings lifting from the lagoon. And then Kaya, only six at the time, heard the door screen slap. Standing on the stool, she stopped scrubbing grits from the pot and lowered it into the basin of worn-out suds. No sounds now, but her own breathing. Who had left the shack? Not Ma. She never let the door slam. But when Kaya ran to the porch, she saw her mother in a long brown skirt, kick pleads, nipping at her ankles, as she walked down the sandy lane in high heels. The stubby-nosed shoes were fake alligator skin, her only going out pair. Kaya wanted to holler out, but knew not to rouse Pa. So she opened the door and stood on the brick and board stairs. From there, she saw the blue train case Ma carried. Usually, with the confidence of a pup, Kaya knew her mother would return with meat wrapped in greasy brown paper or with a chicken head dangling down. But she never wore the gator heels, never took a case. Thank you. Hi, visionaries. I will be reading from the book called The Prophet. It's a poetry book by Khalil Gibran. I will read from the passage that speaks about love since it's February. Then said Amiltra, speak to us of love. And he raised his head and looked upon people, and there fell a stillness upon them. And with a great voice he said, When love beckons you, follow him. Though his ways are hard and steep, and when his wings enfold you to yield to him, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you, and when he speaks to you, believe in him. Though his voice may shatter your dreams as the north wind lays waste the garden, for even as love crowns you, so shall he crucify you. Even as he is for your growth, so is he for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun, so shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. Like sheaves of corn, he gathers you unto himself. He threshes you to make you naked. He sifts you to free you from husks. He grinds you to whiteness. He kneads you until you are pliant. And then he assigns you to his sacred fire, that you may become sacred bread for God's sacred feast. All these things shall love do unto you, that you may know the secrets of your heart and in that knowledge become a fragment of life's heart. But if 
in your fear you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, then it is better for you that you cover your nakedness and pass out of love's threshing floor into the seasonless world where you shall laugh but not all of your laughter and weep but not all of your tears. Love gives not but itself but takes not but from itself. Love possesses not for it would be possessed for love is sufficient unto love. When you love you should not say God is in my heart but rather I am in the heart of God. And think not you can direct the course of love. For love, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. Love has no other desire but to fulfill itself. But if you love and must needs have desires, let these be your desires. To melt and be alike a running brook that signs its melodies to the night. To know the pain of too much tenderness. To be wounded by your own understanding of love and to bleed willingly and joyfully. To awake at dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving. To rest at the noon hour and meditate love ecstasy. To return home at eventide with gratitude and then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise upon your lips. The end. Right. This is a recording, a recording from my beloved Shakespeare, one of his sonnets. And his sonnets, all, num a number of them, deal with some mysterious lady. So, and this is one of mine, which I think my favourite, which I do believe could be appropriate for this month of love, which is February. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is a star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken, love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. I hope you like that. And that's the end of one of his sonnets taken from an anthology, the Oxford Anthology of British Verse. Good day, everyone. My name is Malkia Sarah Faber Lichfield, and I'm bringing you a part of the story from my book, Are We Not His Children? From the chapter the Magnificent One. Enjoy it. As Paul finally gathered the courage to soldier out of the boys' dormitories to a dining hall, ready to enjoy the curious and disapproving faces of those who left him sick in bed, he heard the sound of squeaking footsteps coming down the corridor. Strangely, the footsteps would stop now and then before continuing for a few moments. This came closer and closer until they seemed to reach the boy's dormitory's front porch. Peeking around the corner, Paul saw that it was Jane, gossiping as usual, with the new volunteer and a part-time domestic, Mama E, the lady with the twitch in her right eye. Then, Miss Busybody whispered to Miss Twitchy, Please, I'm telling you this in confidence. Never ever repeat it to anyone or say that you heard this from me. Mama B likes making a mountain out of a molehill when it comes to this naughty kids. This small, unanticipated disruption was not part of Paul's plan at all, as he had intended to focus on nothing else but the big reward, juice with toasted bread 
bacon and egg. Nothing was going to mess up his food plan. He wasn't going to concern himself with anything else. Who in his right mind would choose to listen to a conversation between Miss Busybody and Miss Twitchy over toasted bread, bacon and egg? Certainly not Paul. But as he was about to head for the dining room, he had something said that would change how he perceived his world from that moment onwards. You know, all the children in our orphanage have unhappy stories. I mean, some really sad stories which have brought them there. As he had that, Paul boasted to himself, all but me. He would have loved to break into the secret conversation and let the two ladies know just how special he was. Have you seen him? Miss Twitchy shook her head. All right then. I'll stand next to him and cough tonight when I collect the dishes in the dining hall, whispered Jay. Paul had raised his ears like a little puppy, waiting for his owner. He was not the one to eat straw, but he could not help himself. This tantalizing gossip was perhaps a little bit of privileged news which could be of use to him and his best buddy, Vuyo. He wondered, who could possibly be the darkest boy in the orphanage? Surely, it could not be him. He couldn't be possibly darker than Bushe or Vuyo. Besides, who on earth could be darker than Vuyo? Then, the gossip dropped a bombshell. His name is Paul. Paul was about to yell, lies, lies, all lies. When Miss Busybody blurted out, he believes that he was brought in by angels. But the truth of the matter is that he was really found by a homeless man who had been salvaging at the rubbish town. Apparently, the tramp reported that he had <laughs> cried Miss Busybody. Awawena, said the new lady almost in tears. Come, Miss Easy. Can you believe it? Good day, everybody. My name is Princess Alzoe Litchfield. Today I'm gonna read you a story from a book. I'm gonna read you a story from a book called Stories from a Sop. A sop was a Greece man who made up stories and told them to women and men and children. He was also the servant of a rich man. Today, I am going to be reading you one of his stories. The man who tried to please everybody. One fine morning, a farmer went to town to sell his donkey. His son went with him. The farmer led the donkey and his son walked beside him. They sang as they walked along. The farmer and his son passed some girls on the road. The girls began to laugh at them. <laughs> What's wrong with your donkey? asked the girls. Nothing, replied the farmer. I am going to sell him in town for a lot of money. Ha <laughs> ha, you silly to walk all the way, said the girl. Let your little boy ride. The farmer wanted to please the girls. He lifted his son onto the donkey and walked on beside them. The father walked on along the road. <clears throat> Further along the road, the farmer and his son met an old man. The old man shook his stick at the boy. What a selfish boy you are, he cried. Riding the donkey while your poor father walks. To please the old man, the father lifted his son and got onto the donkey himself. As they went on their way, the farmer and his son met some women and children. One of the women pointed to the father. Look at that lazy man, she said. He rides the donkey and makes his poor little boy walk. To please the woman, the father helped his son to get up behind the 
behind him. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Bye. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Ole Rato. My stay name is Rama Seji. The title of the book I'm reading from is called My Dream in the Drawer. The authors are Megan Seni Luther. Fred, and his name is Stradon, and Mertely Klein. My dream in the drawer, and this book belongs to me. I'm going to read the book Peaks and Valleys by Spencer Johnson. Feeling low in a valley, once there was a bright young man who lived unhappily in a valley until he went to see an old man who lived on a peak. When he was younger, he had been happy in his valley. He played in its meadows and swam in its river. The valley was all he had ever known and he thought he would spend his whole life there. Some days in his valley were cloudy and some were sunny, but there was a sameness to his daily routine that he found comforting. However, as he grew older, he began to see what was wrong more often than he noticed what was right. He wondered why he had not noticed before how many things were wrong in the valley. As time went on, the young man became increasingly unhappy, although he was not sure why. He tried working at different jobs in the valley, but none turned out to be what he had hoped for. In one job, his boss always seemed to criticize him for what he did wrong and never noticed all the things he did right. In another, he was one of so many employees that it did not seem to matter to anyone whether he worked hard or hardly worked at all. His contribution seemed invisible, even to himself. Once he thought he had finally found what he wanted, he felt appreciated and challenged. He worked with capable colleagues and he was proud of the company's project. He worked his way up and became manager of a small department. Unfortunately, he felt his job was not secure. His personal life was no better. One disappointment seemed to follow another. He thought his friends did not understand and his family told him he was just going through a phase. The young man wondered if he would be better off someplace else. Sometimes the young man would stand in the meadow and look up at the range of majestic peaks that rose high above his valley. He would imagine himself standing on the nearby peak. For a while, he felt better. 
But the more he compared the peak to his valley, the worse he felt. He spoke to his parents and friends about going to the peak, but they talked only about how difficult it was to reach the peak and how comfortable it was to stay in the valley. They all discouraged him from going where they themselves had never been. The young men loved his parents and knew there was some truth to what they said, but he also knew that he was a different person from his father and mother. Sometimes he felt there might be a different way of life outside the valley and he wanted to discover it for himself. Maybe on the peak he could gain a better view of the world, but then doubt and fear crept in again and he thought he would stay where he was. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On this 11th hour of uh, the deadline for our reading aloud, I'm going to read to you from Bo Bryson's uh, book, Neither Here Nor There, Travels in Europe. I'm going to start reading on page 37. On my 16th day in Hammerfest, it happened. I was returning from the headland after my morning walk, and in an empty piece of sky above the town, there appeared a translucent cloud of many colors, pinks and greens and blues and pale purples. It glimmered and seemed to swirl. Slowly it stretched across the sky. It had an oddly oily quality about it, like the rainbows you sometimes see in a pool of petrol. I stood transfixed. I knew from my reading that the northern lights are immensely high up in the atmosphere, something like 200 miles up. But this show seemed to be suspended just above the town. There are two kinds of northern light, the curtains of shimmering gossamer that everyone has seen in pictures, and the rather rare gas clouds that I was gazing at now. They are, nev they are never the same, twice. Sometimes they shoot wraith like across the sky, like smoke in a wind tunnel, moving at enormous speed, and sometimes they hang like luminous drapes or glittering spears of light, and very occasionally, perhaps once or twice in a lifetime, they creep out from every point on the horizon and flow together overhead in a spectacular silent explosion of light and color in the depthless blackness of the countryside where you may be a hundred miles from the nearest artificial light they are capable of the most weird and unsettling optical illusions they can seem to come out of the sky and fly at you at enormous speeds as if trying to kill you apparently it's terrifying to this day, many labs earnestly believe that if you show the lights a white handkerchief or a sheet of white paper, they will come and take you away. They dis this display was relatively small stuff, and it lasted for only a few minutes, but it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen, and it would, be, would do me until something better came along. In the evening, something did, a display of lights that went on for hours. They were, they were of only one color, that eerie luminous green you see on radar screens, but the activity was frantic. Narrow swirls of light would sweep across the great dome of sky, then hang there like vapor trails. Sometimes they flashed across the sky like falling stars and sometimes they spun languorously, reminding me of the lazy way smoke used to rise from my father's pipe when he was reading. Sometimes the lights would flicker brightly in the west, then vanish in an instant and reappear a moment later behind me, as if teasing me. I was constantly turning and twisting to see it. You have no idea how immense the sky is until you try to monitor it all. The eerie thing was how silent it was. 
Such activities seem to demand at the very least an occasional low boom or a series of static-like crackles. But there was none. All this immense energy was spent without a sound. Good evening, fellow visionary readers. Today I'm going to be reading from the book The Secret by Rhonda Pine. What is the secret? Bob Proctor says, You've probably been sitting there wondering, what is the secret? I'll tell you how I've come to understand it. We all work with one infinite power. We all guide ourselves by exactly the same laws. The natural laws of the universe are so precise that we don't even have any difficulty building spaceships. We can send them to the moon and we can time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. Wherever you are, India, Australia, New Zealand, Stockholm, London, Toronto, Montreal, or New York, we are all working with one power, our one law, it's attraction. The secret is the law of attraction. Every thought of yours is a real force. Everything that's coming into your life, you are attracting into your life and is attracted to you by virtue of the images you are holding in your mind. It's what you are thinking. Whatever is going on in your mind, you are attracting to you. The greatest teachers who have ever lived have told us that the law of attraction is the most powerful law in the universe. It is the law that determines the complete order in the universe. Every moment of your life and every single thing you experience in your life. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. The law of attraction is forming your entire life experience. And this all-powerful law is doing that through your thoughts. You are the one who calls the law of attraction into action. And you do it through your thoughts.